Welcome back to another episode of No Ordinary Woman, where we recognise and celebrate women of all ages and all stages. I'm Fiona Briffa, and today joining me is Frida Umahosa. How are you, Frida? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Um, Frida has an amazing story to share with us today that I truly appreciate you coming and sharing with us. Uh, Frida was part of a genocide in Rwanda, which she's going to just talk us through a little bit. Um, and uh, she's just going to talk us through some of the processes of surviving such a traumatic experience. But Frida, I just want to share a little bit around what happened when you were 14 years old. So um, growing up in Rwanda, you know, um, I, I knew from the age of six uh, um, that I was a wrong tribe, which was a Tutsi tribe. And we had the three tribes. You had the uh, Tutsis, which was my tribe, the Hutus, which was the majority, and then we had the Batwa. Uh, but um, then fast forwarding, you know, going through school and everything, you know, I, I already knew as a, as a child from school that I, you know, was a wrong tribe. But then fast forwarding to the time when uh, my family was killed, I had uh, five siblings and um, my parents and my grandparents lived uh, close by um, in the same village where I grew up yeah. and um, uh, on the 6th of April um, 1994 the Hutu prison was assassinated. Uh, we already knew that genocide was uh, being prepared. We already knew like from my friends from the time when I was about 10 we already knew that um, my friends will come and tell us that we were on the list of the people that are supposed to die. Oh and um, it, it's a very, uh, you know, history wise, it's, um, you could go back into the uh, research and, and find out that the two sisters had been killed in 1959. And then the ones that were able to leave the country that time were then uh, trying to come back home and rebelling the, the, the country. And so that caused a lot of trouble for the ones that were inside the country. Then the Hutus said, well, if you come back, you find none of your family. But wow. back to the when I was 14, on that day when the Hutu prison was assassinated, it was then like a trigger where they blamed it on the Tutsis, but it had already been you know, organized anyways. We already knew but we couldn't even leave for all those years. We were locked inside the country. You couldn't move from one town to another. So they had prepared it very well, oh. the point that you could not leave. Mm. So from that night, we had to leave uh, our homes and start hiding in the bushes, in the, in the woods. Yeah. And then, um, so that had, then the, the, the genocide that had been prepared, that was now a, a, in action for three months for, a hundred days, it happened April, May, and June. So oh. for a hundred days, a million Tutsis were slaughtered and killed. Oh my uh, so my family was killed in May, um, on, on, on the 7th of May. Yeah. And um, when they attacked our home, we were at my grandparents, we were 18 of us, mm. and they came into our home and got us out of outside the house um, what was already broken home yeah. and we were taken to a ditch where we were then um, offered to be killed with whatever you could choose um, so you had to choose between a club a spear a machete or a knife mm. because there was no um, the bullet wasn't wasn't an offer yeah uh, you had to pay in my village to be killed um, by a bullet we, we to be shot you had to pay because obviously we were caused cockroaches and snakes who were less than humans to them oh, wow. and therefore uh, it, that to be shot was a, an expensive death you have to pay for it so I was then um, uh, hit by a young man um, called John you were killed by people that you knew very well friends yeah. next door friends so the people that came to my house are people that I knew mm. and um, I was hit at the back of my head and lost my consciousness and buried alive with together with my entire family mm. and um, hours and hours later I was rescued by a young man who um, was called by a woman who had my voice screaming in the in the ground yeah. so he came and rescued me so that's that's what happened and that's yeah. how I lost my entire family then that is like there. There are no words to even. The, I don't. I can't find any words for that. But I. It wasn't just that though. Like from your book, I've um, obviously read your book. Um, uh, Chosen to die, destined to live, 
And it was a whole month of running and torture and hiding and basically preparing to die over and over and over again. Like you were taken to, you know, uh, one place and then sent back because they decided that they didn't have the energy or time or whatever. And then you would hide somewhere else and then you would drag back out. And so every day it was like... uh, uh, emotional and mental torture of is today going to be today the day and yes. you know the stories about your grandfather singing as you march towards the mm-hmm. the gate the first time when you thought that it was going to be over and then being sent back and it was that sort yes. of torture went on and hiding in the hills and the mountains for a whole month yes. before yes. they finally yeah uh, so there is the torture before actually before the April, before the actual genocide of yeah. you are not given the same rights as a citizen. You actually consider to be less than human. That That's a torture itself yeah. for a child and for an adult and for yeah. parents with and for families. It was just a torture. And then you get to a point where now uh, what is being prepared, what you have been feeling all your, all your life now has come to uh, actually has come to be a reality of your life. So when we left home and we started hiding in bushes and left home, our homes were destroyed. So they will destroy homes and uh, so that even if you survive, you have no home to, to live in. Mm. But as you said, hiding in bushes all night, yeah. uh, you, you just lived in survival mode. Like you yeah. knew uh, if I don't die this hour, I may die the next hour or the next minute. If I'm not captured now, I may be captured in the next few minutes. Yeah. If somebody is able to help me and hide me for a few days, yeah. tomorrow they may not be the person who want to hide me still because they can get in trouble for that as well. Yeah. And so it was, it was, a, it was a time of uh, terror. It was a time of uh, trauma all those three months every single day mm-hmm. every so you, if you think of it this way it's 10 more than 10,000 Tutsis will be killed breakfast time lunch time and dinner time if you if you think of it that that way yeah. because you know over a million Tutsis were killed over 100 days so it was a hundred days of trauma a yeah. hundred days of, uh, of of terror mm-hmm. um so as you know just because I just kind of like uh, gave the whole view of the day that my family was killed. But the, the, the month before, the weeks before when yeah. you were taken to a roadblock and on that roadblock, you, you knew you may not leave. You may yeah. not leave that you're going to die there or you're going to see where you will see women being raped. You'll see yeah. people being killed. So it was just um, a time of torture. Torture. Yeah. yeah. It- as I was reading through that part of your story and I just thought that that is like that is a lot of torture and trauma on on a brain and then all these kids that were a part of that and yourself at only 14 yeah. how does your 14 year old brain process what's going on or does it shut down and just go into survival mode uh you mean at the moment my yeah, at that moment no my at the mom at that moment my 14 year old was um trying to cope with uh, with that, that moment, with that second in, in terrible fear, yeah. in terrible, but at that moment, because I was still with my family, mm-hmm. I still knew that, okay, yes, I am terrified and I'm scared and I'm traumatized, but I am with my family. Yeah. When my family was killed, I think on that day that my family was killed and walked away from that ditch after being buried alive, mm. that's when I lost hope. I then... Yeah thought to myself you know what I can't care less if I die now because you know um to begin with it was only May and the genocide was still going on and so um it, to me after because my father was not with us in the ditch he was on the roof and they got him afterwards and they yeah. killed him and I heard the singing of the, the chanting of the people that just killed him so when I heard the people that killed my father yeah to me it was the end of the world it was like you know what, I can't care less exactly. now if, they, if I die. Because he was your last hope. You know, yeah, it was my last hope. Yeah. But I can't really explain that my 14-year-old then um, had the hope of, oh, I will suffer. No, I, you just live minute by minute. Yeah, you, know, right. you don't have time to think, how yeah. do I feel? Yeah. I, I didn't even cry. I couldn't cry because it was just too much. Yeah. And I, at the same time, you think... I, your, your 14 year old brain is te- is asking is this 
actually going on? Is this real? Yeah. Or are you going crazy? Yeah. So you are in denial at the same time. Yeah. It was like your brain trying to protect you of what the reality was around you. It was like, no, right. this isn't happening. I'm having a bad dream. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, it's just, it, it is something that you just, it is sad to know that anybody endures and the fact that you are the sole survivor out of all of that family. And there were people, people that, you, as you said, you went to school with and these yes. are, you know, um, different, uh, different uh, kids living side by side that suddenly were now turning against you. Yes. How do how does that register in your brain when you're going, right? We just played outside together the other day and now you're walking around with a machete. I think that's what makes it very hard for, for Rwandans for Tutsi survivors because you were killed by somebody that uh, that was a friend, that yeah. was a friend to your father or a friend of your mother, or people that you played with, as you're saying, and, and that's what makes it very hard. Um, had become, you know, a, a, a heavy uh, burden in the in our society because that trust was gone. That trust was broken of mm -hmm. trusting somebody next door. Yeah. Um, but again, like I said, uh, for me as a person, uh, it took me a lot of years to be able to move on to uh, being able to even like you say. Um, that I can't even talk to the Hutu uh, people. I, I can openly say that I hated them for yeah. years and anybody would. And yeah. I um, gone to a point where like, how, how do you even talk to them? How do you even have a, a conversation with somebody who, who was a friend and then the next minute turns to your daughter to come and kill you? Yeah. But again, on the other hand, because I think the genocide had been something that had been built being built up for years and years I think we've somehow prepared in our minds that something will come but not to a point of a genocide not to a point of killing a million people within three months yeah so I, I don't have any I don't have any words to actually express and explain how that happened that a million people were killed within yeah. that short amount of time yeah and and as I was reading that part of the story and just thinking how does somebody, what must happen in somebody that you can suddenly just be a normal human being one minute and the next minute be happy to pick up a weapon and turn against your neighbours and your friends? And obviously never yeah. having been put in that position, I can't even like reconcile that in my brain. But right. like so many people, I do, like, can I sit here and say, if somebody threatened my family, I wouldn't do the same thing. I, I just don't know. And I never want to ever have to be in that position. But it doesn't matter how you reconcile it. It must be so hard to get to the point that you can forgive or even look them in the face again. So how, what yeah. sort of process do you go through to get to the point of forgiveness? For yeah, what look. When it when when it comes to forgiveness, I, I don't think a human nature is actually able to reconcile that and be able to. Uh, it has to take uh, the help of God. That's that's for me. Um, that's uh, that's where I, I I regain my source of strength to right. my faith and and uh, be able to have walked that journey. But again, it is a very long journey. Even when you're a Christian, it's a very long journey and a hard journey. And it's a traumatic journey. Yeah. I'm not going to, um, you know, have it to say that it was easy for me because it wasn't. Yeah. Um, uh, you asked the question about uh, how does somebody wake up one morning, turn from just a good neighbor to there had been a lot of brainwashing for over right. the years, I said, and teaching. You know, hatred is taught, you know, as yeah, we say. Yeah. Hatred is, 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 a, is a taught uh, behavior. And so in the school, when I was six and we were being taught, you are a cockroach, the other person is oh, special. Right. Then already as a child, you are being taught that this is a, a less than a human being and therefore you can crush them as you right. want. Right. And so it had been, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing, it's a very long process. They, uh, yeah. they really um, took their time to prepare for that. And right. the fact that the government was behind it and supported it and funded it, um, that was another thing as well. Yeah. Uh, in terms of how did I move from that hatred and from that trauma, uh, it, it was a very long and hard journey for me. Yeah. Uh, but when I became a Christian I, when I was 18 and I became a Christian and, yeah. you know, I was a Christian before, but then when I 
was serious now with my walk with God yeah. and asked, uh, you know, I knew then I had to um, walk that journey of not, of, of not hating, yeah. hating them as they hated me yeah. and how to get to that. It had to take the, 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 the supernatural power of God, so yeah. to speak. And, wow. um, and then for me, I'm a kind of person that likes, um, uh, confronting my own fears yeah. uh, in the, in order to move on okay. uh, and I was still living in the same country where I see them where I go to the same school with them where I have photo uh, uh, teachers and so for me it was a matter of well now I know that I can and I, I want to walk that journey and I have accepted that journey with God but I actually want to see it in real life yeah. and for me to feel that and to know that that hatred had um, vanished from my heart yeah. I had to go see these people which I don't recommend for everybody or yeah. anybody um, yeah. in a traumatic um, situation but yeah. for me I needed it because I was still living in the same country I was still yeah. living with these people wow. so when I did that and confronted my own fears and went to meet the people in the prison and at home in my own village to see them and speak with them the first time was very hard I went wow. back crying and I couldn't do it yeah. I said this is impossible yeah uh, but I knew the harder it gets it's also that uh, my own prison will have to break and I yeah. am the one with the key to that prison of hatred yeah and um, when I was then able wow. to go back the second time be able to speak with them and tell them and that, that I had which you know a lot of people find it crazy to yeah. how do you go tell someone that you've forgiven them but uh, it's all about it's all about what you um what you want in your life and the choices that because it's forgiveness is for you it's for yeah. me before it's for the perpetrator yeah. the perpetrator yeah. it was me hurting it was yeah. me um de developing all those issues with my own life because of hatred because of fear because of trauma I needed that for me. Yeah. So I did that for me before I did it for, for them. Yeah. And when then I was able to do that, to walk that hard journey, I actually found peace within oh, myself. Right. Peace um, with, I don't have to hate these people. Yeah. Um, I found peace in me. Now I can start walking my healing journey day after day. Yeah. You know, so... so that that saying that you don't forgive because they deserve it you forgive because you deserve it yes really true very true i think one of the one of the key points when it comes to forgiveness forgiveness i think uh, what hinders forgiveness of uh, people offering forgiveness is because sometimes they think um, people think if I forgive them, I'm letting them uh, off the hook and they, I'm letting, yeah, and yeah. It's, you know, it's injustice continuing. And that's not what forgiveness is all about. Forgiveness is about healing yourself first. Yeah, I think that's a really important message. It's not letting them off the hook. And I, th I really agree with you there. We do tend to hold on to things because it's like, well, they, you know, I don't want to let them off the hook. What they did was wrong. But it's letting yourself yeah. off the hook for carrying around that burden and heaviness of yes. that unforgiveness, isn't it? Right. Yeah. So that must have been a really long process and long journey to get to that point there. And like you said, you you didn't do it yourself. I think that's the sort of thing. Yeah. You, it's not human nature to be gracious and giving and forgiving. And um, there is that, you know, obviously you had help. Yes. So yes when you when you go through something like that and you say you were a christian like do you then go where where were you god <laughs> did you question yes. god oh, even yeah. with your faith oh yes yeah i went through angry at god being yeah. angry at god where were you why did you let this happen and i went through uh, being angry at myself why why was I the one to survive why couldn't somebody else survive why am I the one chosen yeah. to actually go through this pain yeah. um, I went through all sorts of you know turmoil that you can think of as just an anger and denial and what if maybe somebody else in my family so you go all those stages of of, of um 
of grieving, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah my, my faith was shaken because my grandfather had been a wonderful man and in, in the community was a Christian and taught as the Bible and everything. Mm. And so, and, and my family died, died, um, was killed praying. Praying, yeah, so, your grandfather. And yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, my grandfather had led us into a prayer, even to the point of us walking to the ditch where we were killed. My grandfather led us into a hymn that says, yeah. um, you know, we are bodies that, that can be killed, but our spirits will never die. I sang mm. that, but deep inside, I had questions for this God. Yeah. who calls himself a God of mercy and a God of power. Why are you not coming down to save us? Yeah. So I had all, all those questions. I went through all those demo, but then I realized, you know, um, God has given all of us a free, uh, of, a, a free will of choice and, yeah. and we, we make those choices. I make my own choices. If I make choices to lie, he's not gonna come down and stop me. I'll have yeah. consequences. Right. I'll have consequences of my own actions, but I, it, I had to learn all that and understand all that. And yeah. then I also came to a point of understanding, yes, but the same God that I'm asking all these questions is also the same God that make it, made it happen that I was buried alive for 14 hours, but he still preserved me and still That's took me out of that grave. How right. How is that possible? Yeah. Like I actually died in and lost consciousness, but brought me back and yeah. why? Yeah. Then I got to that, when I got to that point of asking the whys yeah. and the how do I find the purpose of why am I here? Yeah. Then I actually, what it less done? Why didn't you save me versus what, what now? What can I yeah, do? What can I do with this now? Yes. Yeah. And it wasn't just it wasn't just surviving that blow to the head and the burial. There was a lot of things after that that should never have happened. Like the the guys that found you and just left you there. And yes. that, that, that shouldn't have happened. Like they should by all means that they normally would have killed someone that they found alive because they were ordered to do that. But you kept getting left alive over and over and over again. So that's where I guess that, well, here's the flip side of that so it just yes. yeah but it must have been such a a struggle with with your faith to get to that point where where you needed to get to but I mean that's a whole a whole nother story but I mean I'm I'm really glad that you survived and that you're still here and what you've gone on to do since has been amazing and just to um to just uh, share a little bit about Frida's journey past there is now you are the mother of a combined family of seven kids yes, <laughs> yes. and yes. you've got uh, you're living in Australia now Melbourne yes we are a blended family so we've got our four boys and um and and three girls yes. and um yes so we live in Melbourne and uh, you know a thriving family <laughs> teenagers and yeah so um and be prior to me moving to Australia to um, Melbourne, I lived in America before then. So, and then that's another uh, another thing where after surviving the genocide, I've moved from country to country, yeah. and sometimes because of life, um, and other times because we, like right after the genocide, I was adopted. And I lived with the family that adopted and then didn't leave home, but they were related to my mom, then they came home. So, but all that has become something that I've learned, you know, when you're a survivor, you also learn to enjoy, um, um, how do I call it? You learn, you learn to, to adapt yourself with new cultures and new lives. Yeah, and, right. Yeah. It's like become a chameleon, just to adapt to the new environments and the new what, whatever comes next. Is that is that what it is? Yeah, 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 that as well. But I think life has trained me to embrace that family is where they love you as well. Oh, I'm wow. not saying that I, I don't have like when I moved from America to here I had had time settling in and because I'm, I guess because I was older and my family was bigger and so on but uh, I get to I get to enjoy new cultures to enjoy new people because I love making friends and, and so on yeah. but you actually learn to you know you know what I could have died you know all those yeah. years and there's other things that I have overcome in my life and yeah. so a better learn to how to enjoy um yeah. enjoy people and yeah. the family that family is when you lose a family mm. your family becomes the ones that you choose 
Yeah. You know, the friends you choose, the people that are around you that accept you, that love you. You you, you find a, an opportunity that people can actually enjoy being with you because you've yeah. lost the dear family. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's that's beautiful and so true. Your family becomes whoever loves you. Yes. Whoever embraces you and, and you must have collected a lot of people on the way. Have you been back to Rwanda since? Yes, I've, like I said, I lived in Rwanda right after the genocide home until I was 32 and then I moved to America. But since then, I've gone back home twice. I went in 2018 and 2019. And every time that I go, I make sure that I go to my village and where I grew up because I've rebuilt my home. And that was oh. my legacy. That was something I wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, my home was destroyed. But then I said, I, I, I'll rebuild my home as a sign of restoration. And I'll make yeah. sure that when my kids grow up, they know the history. They have that legacy. Yeah. And I refuse. I refuse to um, have had lost my family and lose my home. So, yeah, wow. yeah, so that's what I've done. So every time I go, I go visit. I have a family that I sponsor that lives yeah. in that same home, yeah. oh, just my like family. my mother would have loved to have. Uh, yeah. And I've made sure that I brought back, because we, we lived in a countryside where we had all animals. I made sure I brought back every animal that we used to have. Wow. About cows, goats. Shape in all those things. It's, yeah, I suppose it's a, a physical rebuilding as well as an emotional and a mental rebuilding as well, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, you like, know what? It's it's just it's just a house. I, it's it doesn't feel a home because my mom is not there, my yeah. siblings are not there. But it does actually make me. It gives me joy and sense of empowerment to see it, um, to see it rebuilt because it was yeah. completely down, and I, I rebuilt it the way that my father would have done. Wow, that is amazing. What an amazing end to a, a very tragic beginning and, and just the, the resilience and the forgiveness and the kindness and the grace and the beautiful light that shines out from within you is just, um, you spend enough time with Frida, anybody, and you just see this light shining and I think it's just so beautiful. And um, I just wanted to mention that if you wanted to know more about Frida's story, I've got a copy. Um, you can get a copy of her book and I'm going to leave it in the link um, in the description. So it, it's, it is a, it, well, it's a tearjerker at the beginning, but it's quite heartwarming in, in a lot of places. And it's a story not just about the, the trauma, but about amazing resilience and forgiveness and rebuilding, like Frida said, of not just the physical, but the emotional self as well. And um, there's, yeah, there's so much more to the story. I really encourage anybody to go out and, and grab a copy of that book because there's so much more to you, Frida, than you. This, this short amount of time. But um, I will wrap it up and just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for just sharing so honestly and openly about your No Ordinary Woman journey, Frida. Oh, thank you so much, Fiona, for having me. It's absolutely that. my pleasure. So if you want to know more about Frida, you can have a look in the link below. And thank you all so much for joining us for another episode of No Ordinary Woman. And we'll see you again soon. Bye for now.